getting inside now. Well, it's a bit damp in here, I'm not gonna lie. Oh. Ooh, I don't know. Yeah, we might need a we might need a dehumidifier or something. Wait, wait a minute. Hold on, I see something. This might be it. Uh, I don't know. Something's happening. Oh. Cease to exist. Ah, you guys hear that? Come and say you love me. Yeah. Yeah, we got some Manson still in here. Give up your yeah. work. Uh, hold on, let me just Come on, you try, try this again. Oh, that's a little better. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know, let me see. Let me just... Ah, there we go. Nah, guys, it's perfect. Well, welcome back to The Empire Never Ended. It was a, a short summer break, but now we've, we've moved into our new compound, our new American outposts here in, in Death Valley, uh, an underwater cave. Um, yeah. You're kind of hard-pressed to find underwater cave, I think, in Death Valley. Man. It's kind well, of I should say a, place a, on Earth. it's a cave full of water. It's yes. a grotto. It's an under-desert cave full of water. Yeah. That's right. All right. Yeah. Uh, outside, you know sweltering hot 103 degrees inside about 37 because we use celsius here and uh we're just gonna we're just gonna survive and survive gray. the apocalypse yeah survive the apocalypse down here and mm. and talk you know and tell some stories tell some so americana what, yeah, yeah what are we getting into then today let's see. well let's introduce or, I mean, maybe the, the, the whole arc maybe yeah. i don't know we should introduce the whole arc and apocalypse is a big part of it by the way yeah, it absolutely. seems absolutely yes. yeah americans love the apocalypse it seems. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll be, uh, so we're at the f start of a new arc. This is the first episode in our third arc, and it will be an arc about American fascism. And I think it's it's relatively ambitious, I think, because it will be about 30 episodes, and we'll cover, well, almost the entire of the 20th century, and uh, <laughs> at least the part relevant to fascism. Basically, starting from the 20s and probably ending in the 80s, we'll see exactly when we'll end. Um, so, yeah, it will be something like 60 years of American fascism. Hopefully, yeah. we'll kind of cover the main trends um, in American fascism. Uh, yeah, that's it. And yeah, I mean, getting into this, I saw like a lot of things that I was generally familiar with. But then uh -huh. a lot of stuff that I had absolutely no clue about. So it's been actually really interesting for me to to read some of the yeah. uh, stuff for this arc. It's for me. It's a kind of um, I'm kind of beginning to now research uh, all of this, but it's uh, it's surprising how many connections I see. Yeah, uh, that it's kind quite of a web. Um, that connect uh, like parts of American fascism that I didn't know previously were connected in such a way. Uh -huh. mm. For example, these specific ideas about that we mentioned apocalypse and Christian identity stuff. And some of these things seem to have been a part of American fascism throughout, uh, you know, the 20th century and are still there uh, in uh, yeah. very much in the, the newest examples that we discussed in our first arc. Yeah. And so to kick it off, we're going to start with, um, I don't know, the, 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 the daddy of America in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. Also kind of, uh, I would say he's a, um, 
an early archetype of a, of a very American style of fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he also is a man who's going to give um, a lot of credence to later anti-Semitic uh, writings and beliefs and um, all sorts of shit. We're, we'll, 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 it's Henry Ford. We're going to talk about Henry Ford. You guys know him. Mm -hmm. I, my favorite car growing up was a, was a Ford station wagon that uh, some Jeep crashed into when I was delivering pizzas and, I never got over it. And, uh, so you're and so not a, is... a Ford truck man? Well, or... no, my family was a Ford truck man. We had the Ford F-150, the Ford F-350, and then I think an extended Ford F-350 at some point. So uh, this man is, is near and dear to me. And I was uh, really, really happy when I was, you know, when I got to like pick Henry Ford as my guy, because I thought for sure we'll start off with like a... A lovely story about an American hero, you know, mm -hmm. uh, someone that we all greatly admire. And wouldn't you know it, guys, he's a he's a, it turns out he's a total fucking Nazi. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, how about I've, that? I've heard rumors. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's about how this uh, episode um, writing this episode went for me is that like we all heard a bit about it. You know, we all kind of heard something about Henry Ford being anti-Semitic, maybe about him being like a complete fucking psycho in the factory. You know, we, we did, but, uh, man, damn, like looking at it right in the face is something else. So that's what we're yeah, going to do Yeah. When it comes today. to like uh, American legends, like I think a lot of people have, um, some understanding that like Walt Disney and Henry Ford were like absolutely yeah. fucking insane. Um, but the more you read about it, the more you see connections that make it even more like yeah. disturbing and insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's very interesting and in a very dark way that, you know, uh, when we discuss uh, American fascism, one of the most important persons to dis discuss is Henry Ford, who was yeah. one of the most influential and wealthy Americans at the time. And not only that, but also kind of his name is synonymous with the development of capitalism in the, right. the first half of the century. He gets his own ism. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a big deal that he was who he was, I think. So on that, I've decided to sort of separate this episode into basically two parts. And one of them is going to be Henry Ford, the capitalist, and the other is Henry Ford, the the, the rabid anti-Semite, you know, <laughs> Nazi. <laughs> so uh, we'll save, you know, All we'll right. save the best for last there. Um, but let's jump into who this, who this guy is. So uh, Henry Ford was born to farmers near Dearborn, Michigan in 1863, and his dad arrived in 1847 with like that huge Irish migration of 1847, um, even though he was not himself like e ethnically Irish. His mother was an American born woman of uh, Belgian immigrant parents who was like raised by Irish people and his family is, is Episcopalian, which is essentially like Anglican Catholics. Right. He's not really religious. That's not really his thing. But like, we're going to see as we go on that religion ends up taking a very weird intersection into Henry Ford's life mm. for later. So when he was just uh, like a wee tyke, you know, he loved machines. I think he probably felt like a kind of a kinship with like the hard inhuman metal, you know. Uh, and already as a child, he kind of seemed to long for a world, I would say, this is my interpretation of his childhood, long for a world kind of like run by an indifferent machines for his like <laughs> personal benefit. Because like, basically, he he begins to like fuck around with watches. And that's nice. You know, he starts to learn how to fix watches and take them apart, put them back together again, like he would later do to like workers. Um, but uh, <laughs> he quickly taught himself all sorts of machinery, worked as a, as a machinist for a while, and uh, eventually he mastered the steam engine kind of while he was working for uh, Thomas Edison, who um, is, is important here because that's another, another guy. Too, though, yeah. But uh, yeah, another guy that doesn't really get enough credit for being like a lunatic anti-Semite, which he was. And, uh, and a lot of people, historians think that um, it was Ford's relationship with Thomas Edison that would be like the start of his... Um, kind of career anti-Semitism. Fucking uh, Edison. Fucking Edison. God damn There's it. nothing to like about that guy. Uh, so he put his own car together, like, as a hobby in 1892. A lot of people, I don't mean, a lot of people think that he, like, invented the car, which is not at all true. Um, not even close. He didn't. He also didn't invent, like, the assembly line or anything like that. Um, he just kind of, I'll, I'll tell you what he did in a second, but basically he <laughs> put his own car together um, and like Edison was super proud about this and like supported it. And then with all this support, he went off to start his own companies in Detroit. And, I mean, this uh, is the thing that with these capitalists to this day that they like to have these myths around them, how they're, you know, also inventors and geniuses. Who, yeah, no, yeah. This is no, 
the, he was, the, I mean, this, he was yeah. good at what he did. Like yeah. he's he's a machinist, you know. No. Yeah. Um, cool, but he didn't <laughs> like <laughs> he didn't invent the wheel here or anything like mm. that. Uh, is that a pun? I don't know. Ooh. So anyway, anyway, uh, he he does a couple companies in Detroit, but he's like a really throughout his life. This is this guy's like an immovable rock, you know. Like once he decides something is the right thing to do, that's it. That's what happens. And he's a control freak also. So he lost both of these companies in Detroit in like a in like a huff. Like he just like quit because they didn't give him all the things he wanted to do, and in in doing so, accidentally created Cadillac, one of his competitors. But oh. um, he was at the time. Here's where like what we call Fordism starts to kind of develop now. So so at the time, he was reliant on all these different uh, manufacturers in Detroit feeding him parts, right, that they would make, and um, and so so in and on top of that. The car was still a, a craftsman's job. Like this was highly skilled labor, and it would mm-hmm. take a while to make one of these things um, because you know they're they're death machines. And um, and he and the problem with that for Ford was essentially like that human part. And what Fordism really is is this extraordinary attempt to eliminate that human part as much as possible and to make specially designed tools that can be that are spe- for very specific purposes that anybody can just put their hand on and use and on top of that have all these molds already designed for specific things that don't have to be assembled so basically uh the key to fordism is like a mass de-skilling and on top mm-hmm. of that um using this sort of assembly line method as a way to uh <laughs> as a way to exert that pressure on labor that is really hard to exert at that point because right like Henry Ford ended up having an almost entirely what you would call like a fixed capital sort of factory setup, you know, where mm-hmm. like um, the the variable capital that is labor uh, was was um, already like squeezed to an extreme because the amount of labor needed for this became less and less and less. That is like the amount of skilled labor. And so also mm-hmm. like the time to make that labor was nothing. You didn't need it. Uh, the state ended up doing all that work for you anyway. And so you end up with this like super tight system where the tools will obviate huge human like uh choice and human action and so uh Mm -hmm. so in the in the 21st century we progressed or regressed i don't know from um american fascists trying to replace the human part with machines to american fascists trying to replace humans with vampires (laughs) (laughs) well i was wondering if something i was i was trying to figure out a good way to make that connection too (laughs) yeah uh well would it surprise you then to learn that henry ford had the inspiration to do this when he visited a slaughterhouse and obviously Mm. in like you know the the rent flesh and rivers of blood he was like "Ah, future future capitalism (laughs) i want to be a part of it (laughs) yeah so uh, it all starts with the animal sacrifice. How about that? Mm. He's a vegetarian, incidentally. Henry Ford is a vegetarian. Yeah, um, he, does, he didn't drink alcohol, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm more suspicious of teetotalers than I am of vegetarians. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a joke. A kid. So one of the things that this like uh, great man idea about Henry Ford has given us is this... Is this um, this idea that like Henry Ford invented the living wage, uh, which I don't know, maybe there is actually a claim to that. Um, but the the story is that like every Ford employee should be able to afford a Ford car. That's the thing that that uh, that you know those of us who grew up in the states probably heard at some point from someone it's uh and it's one of these things that also people like to fall back on to make him like a complicated figure like sure he was like a nazi but but you know he was fantastic to his employees um so i'm gonna tell you really quick why that's complete and utter bullshit uh but first i want to tell you (laughs) what the leftists at the time thought about it so uh gramsci actually wrote about fordism in his prison notebooks and he gave uh, um something that was like far more critical than a lot of other uh, socialists would give it at the time. And so Gramsci said that it's essentially bullshit because 
what its real purpose is to do is to like stop this falling rate of profit that that you get when you have all this like this enormous amount of fixed capital and a very small amount of variable capital that makes like workers who can't afford their own products you know you're cutting out sections of the consumer base and all of this so gramsci pointed out that this is a really good way to keep that money flowing you know that it's mm. not like it's not out of largesse or respect for labor or anything like that obviously okay the other thing that people like to forget is that this five dollar a uh, day, five dollar a day wage, which, by the way, is what essentially what Bernie Sanders is calling for today in today's value? It's about like fifteen dollars an hour or so. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so you have like that structural critique that really this is just part of him trying to like fix as much capital as possible. But uh, you have <laughs> the facts of like what actually this was. So first of all, the five dollar a day wage wasn't the minimum wage. It was an offer that was extended to employees, um, you know, provided that they would submit to what was called the Department of Sociology, oh, the Sociological Department, sorry, or the Department of Society, um, hmm. as well as a, a joint department called the Department of Education. And so this is where, like, as, as rational as Fordism is as like a productive process, Ford himself was always uh, like... A kind of a racist psychopath and that's always gonna like break through um so here's here's how it worked out so basically in order to qualify for this five dollar a day wage um and also profit sharing which was also a you know thing that people like to point to to say that he's like complicated and shit um so in order to meet the requirements for this 100 percent wage increase so the original is like 237 or something like that so this is like over double what your wage should be right you had to submit to constant monitoring and regulation from the sociological department which included unscheduled home visits where people would show up at your house and check to see how clean things were to make sure what? you didn't have any renters or anything they would review employee bank records to monitor like how much they spent and where uh, they would keep track of your kids at school they would teach if you were a married male worker they would teach your wife about cooking and home maintenance and stuff like this and general hygiene and only married male workers could qualify for this if they if their wife didn't work and uh, and if she did work you did not qualify for this and women could only qualify for this if they were single so if they were married, it, w it was assumed that they would stop working altogether, right? And that, that's how that would work out. So this is also, Ford really saw himself as like a really active social force. He, he really believed that he could make the world in his image. And um, one of the things, uh, one of the things, <laughs> have you guys ever heard of Fordlandia? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's a film right. about that now. Yeah, so yeah, so Fordlandia is like an example of this. It was Ford... Uh, at like the at the in the twenties, the Ford Motor Company was in thirty three different countries, and and the whole idea, if you remember, like he was in Detroit, he was stuck because he had to keep trading with other uh, manufacturers for stuff, and and one of the things he decided to do when he started to reopen a, a new plant on uh, River Rouge in Dearborn was that he would just control everything. So at the height of this process, he like he would okay, he would he would buy mines, he would buy plantations, he would buy docks, all these all these things. And then the state would pick up the bill for the rest by providing, you know, proper transport routes, you know, that was specifically feed Ford and other auto manufacturers, etc. So um he in this process so okay, as an example, like at the height of this thing, it would take only 28 hours for ore that the Ford company mined to finish as a car. And because uh, everything was owned and controlled by Ford, every last bit of it. The only thing he couldn't control was rubber. And this was like a big gap in his like impregnable fortress of production here. And so the, the only guys that could produce rubber for a really long time were these Brazilian plantations until uh, the British showed up took a bunch of like seedlings out and opened up their own plantations in their colonies and Brazil kind of lost this monopoly. So Ford, um, 
comes in and offers them a bunch of money to give him like a huge swath of land in the rainforest to start his own rubber plantation. And so he, he does this, but he also builds a town called Fordlandia, which yeah. includes like uh, American style suburban streets with these bungalows everywhere and uh, like a, a public pool and stuff like this. There was a free schooling and, and a, a modern hospital and all this kind of stuff. But it was also just like these workers in America it was designed to make um, these people in Ford's image. And so, for instance, the cafeteria didn't serve meat because he was vegetarian, right? He made them all learn how to square dance because he loved square dance. <laughs> yes. Shit like oh, this. So, so at some point, at some point, uh, it was like Ford too much. square dancing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, at some point, it was like too much for these guys in Brazil. And there was a riot because the cafeteria switched from like having a wait staff to being self-serve. And that was just people were just like enough enough you know so they burned a bunch of the place down and whatever things normalized but the funny thing about this and something that really speaks to ford uh and i guess in a lot of ways like capitalism in general is that ford uh driven to control every bit of the production as he as he was decided to just ignore the botanist that he had paid to tell him how to plant rubber and thought that he would just plant it wherever and whenever he wanted because he figured he knew better. And of course, like they all withered and died and none of the rubber that was salvaged from this thing ever, ever went to Ford. Uh, and then um, whatever, it closed down in like the 40s. It was, it's a ridiculous were there, project. He lost like $200 were there, were there million dollars that, on this by today's standards. Were the people that worked there uh, Brazilians or did they bring in Americans? For this? Quite a lot of native people there. Yeah. Um, uh, so he he, so he made a bunch of Brazilians like do American square dancing. Well, yeah, he tried and, to make a bunch of Brazilians into Americans, and so like this this takes us back to the U.S. where he was doing the same thing. Like fifty six percent of Ford's working staff was immigrants. Were immigrants? There were a hundred mm-hmm. different languages spoken on the factory floor, uh, and this is this yeah, is yeah. Like I, I love the those old like strike 20s. strike posters from that era. Yeah, where like it's in like a dozen different languages. Um, you know, especially in these big immigrant centers like Detroit, and, you know, whatever. Which is also Detroit interesting is. now because, like, <clears throat> a part of the right wing in America, uh, like Trump, even at some points, kind of uh, really uh, they portray this era as you know the the golden age of yeah. American industry and proud American workers and so on. So uh-huh. it's interesting to point out how. These people, many of them didn't even speak English. They were fresh immigrants and so on. Yeah, Ford really contributed to this image as well. Um, mm. But he, will, when we get to his like anti-Semitic writings, we'll see what he really thinks about the American worker. But uh, mm. at the time, there's all... And people even today will say things like, okay, for instance, like Ford opened company stores, right? It's what yeah. capitalists did. And, and he... But he opened these stores like in fucking town like in neighborhoods in detroit and dearborn and stuff like this uh and and did that to shut down every other store in like the block you know everything he did was i think fordism is really just like cybernetic taylorism on like methamphetamines like it's just it's everything that you know has always been fought against in capitalism but just cranked up a bunch you know uh, so it, one of these things is this is, is how he handled this immigrant population which is, must be hard for him because he was also a huge racist. But he, he handled it in this way. So he decided to make them all into like proper Americans. And he, the department, the sociological department, had 200 investigators that, whose only job was to every day like look in on these workers and make sure that they're beginning to become more and more American. And also, if you didn't speak English when you got there, uh, and there, there are good reasons for what he's about to do here that, that do make sense. Uh, you had to undertake the Department of Education's English program, right? Ostensibly, this was because of safety, because you can't have, you need to, you know, speak some common language in this, like, very dangerous production process. But the fact is, is that Ford really didn't give a shit about safety either. I mean, one of the things he's famous for is what he called speed up, which is just what it fucking sounds like, as he would gradually speed up the assembly process bit by bit by bit by bit, like, throughout the day, until workers were, like, you know fucking breaking their bones and shit like trying to keep up with it and then you know you'd slow it back down again like this is torture you know so um all right so so the english department when you when you graduated this course 
And I mean, it's a good deal, right? This is, these are free English classes. You get a huge raise out of it, like an unheard of salary, honestly. Um, pretty good for like an immigrant. There's a good reason why a lot of people went and did this. But at the end, the, the graduation ceremony, he built this like big paper mache uh, cauldron that said American melting pot on it. And all of the immigrant workers had to come to the ceremony dressed in what he believed was their native garb. So they would come in like some like ethnic costume, get into the melting pot after they got their certificate, like disrobe inside the pot and then walk out with like a clean suit and tie. And and it was overtly phrased that these people were boiling away their impurities uh, in order to to come out like true Americans, that you know? is fantastic. Yeah. bizarre. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Um, so uh, and the, so yeah, I said like there are good reasons to engage in this. You get a kick ass raise, you get profit sharing, and all this. It's a it's a pretty big carrot. So but the was, American costume is suit and tie. That's, that's right. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yes, suit and tie. That's <laughs> it. No beard. Um, so. Uh, yeah, but but there is also a stick involved in this, and that was that it wasn't like codified, it wasn't written down everywhere, but everybody knew that if you didn't engage in these things, if you didn't go through the Department of Education, if you didn't allow these inspectors in your home, basically if you didn't take the five dollar uh, wage, you would be fired in six months, and like it was incredibly easy to get fired here. People were fired four or five times, um, but uh, but weirdly, like all of this stuff actually worked. Um, worked to lower the total turnover rate. And this is, I also think where you get a lot of this um, myth of the American worker thing from in a way, because it did stop in the end workers from leaving and the so, turnover so rate. Fritz, I don't know. Like, like, maybe, maybe I missed it. Did you give us uh, like a time frame for w- w- when this exact? is, this is uh, 1913, 1914 still. So this is before 1920s where things okay. get okay. super okay. interesting. So mm-hmm. he's already established like a, a multi-country empire. He already mm-hmm. has inspectors in everybody's houses and shit like that. Um, and uh, so I'm I'm a little confused about the the sociological department. I mean, that's a kind of interesting term, right? Um, who was employed there? What was the criteria for being? Well, it w- it was actually uh, started a sociologist in the sociology department. Um, ha, uh, I don't actually. You know what? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what the qualifications of these inspectors were. It was started by the head of personnel named John Lee, who who, as far as I can tell, like did it out of like decent reasons like his his concern was that accidents were increasing because of miscommunications and so he his whole thought was like why don't we you know figure out how to get everybody communicating together and i think ford interpreted that as why don't we turn everybody into white people so i think that was the just a miscommunication well i mean in uh, in many universities in the beginning of the 20th century you didn't the sociological departments were just being established so you didn't even have them at universities so no, you're right. Right. right you didn't have a lot of people who had a title of a, like a, a sociologist that they got from but that's why i think it's an interesting choice of words but right? that's also yeah. the, the the period when you know it, it is kind of the golden age of this idea of sociology as a kind of they still believed in the possibility of having some kind of a social science they didn't give mm-hmm. up on this um, right so yeah this is probably why it was in fashion to use such a term, like a scientific approach to society. I think mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. also where Fordism kind of separates from Taylorism is that like Taylorism had that a scientific approach to production and it included some shit like that. But again, like mm-hmm. Fordism just took that and cranked it up to 11, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I mentioned that Ford saw himself as like an activist, right? Like a guy that's intervening in society in this way. Uh, and so he, <laughs> he got on a boat. Um, oof, when was this? 1917, uh, I think. Got on this boat with a bunch. He, he chartered it himself. It's like an ocean liner. And he put a bunch of clergymen and writers and politicians and pacifists and businessmen. And he took them all to Europe to, to do God knows what to supposedly inspire the great powers of Europe to make a peace treaty. Um, hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, like it didn't work. Ford was like a laughing stock for a moment about this. There's a lot of time in, in Ford's career where generally speaking, people don't take him seriously, think he's full of shit, don't trust him, don't like him. Like his 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 image of a hero grew over time, you know. Um, 
So on this boat, <laughs> in a sign of things to come. Now, I've got to tell you what the source of this story is. The source of this story is a little suspicious. But I'm going to tell you anyway, just because I think it's a good story. And it is kind of believable when you hear what he does later. Um, the source of this is in the preface to Ford's International Jew, but the um, like okay. the abridged edition. So the the we'll, we'll talk about International Jew like really soon, but in general, it's a four volume text of six hundred and seventy five something pages of like straight ranting about Jews. And there's a, a version that you can find that's only about a, only about two hundred pages. And the the preface to this is written by a South African Nazi um, with like a history background. He. Claims. Claims. And so this little bit comes from that guy. So just grain of salt, you know. Okay. So are we moving into the Henry We're, Ford, uh, a Nazi fascist? Uh, part, or? Not, not quite. This is like, I would call this a sign of things to come. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So on this peace boat, he uh, reportedly gives like a little speech to, to the gathered people. Um, the gathered people include some Jewish community and business leaders that he also invited to get on this boat with him. Uh, so he supposedly says, um, I know who started this war, the German Jewish bankers. And then he reportedly like slaps the coat, the, his like coat pockets and says, I have the evidence here. Facts. I can't give them out just yet because I haven't got them all, but I'll have them soon. Like he, he <laughs> Mike Lindell's these people on the boat and uh and henry like apparently leaves this confused about why jewish people suddenly start to dis distrust him um mm -hmm. but uh we're gonna get to the meat of all the, the anti-semitism soon uh yeah so i mean he's just he's like a ridiculous figure also it's important to keep that in mind he tried to run for senate actually almost won narrowly lost but um yeah he, he's, he's a political guy uh yeah so we talked about fordlandia let's skip that um okay so so uh, to, to, to wrap up the section on um, Ford the capitalist, before we get to Ford the Nazi, uh, we, we need to talk mm -hmm. about how he managed to fix labor so well. Like I mentioned that these, these systems worked, that the turnover rate at the factory did, did reduce when he introduced his $5 wage and all this other shit. Um, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough. So let's talk about a man named um named harry bennett uh, a lot of listeners probably have heard of this guy harry bennett is essentially ford's bulldog so so at the river rouge plant which is now we're now talking about 1916 it's still like a brand new plant it's it is producing stuff it's actually producing some weaponry for uh world war one actually for the uh after the american center and whatever but um uh but anyway like uh the workers despite this raise hate everything else about their job. Like they, there's, it's completely monotonous. It's, they have no time to say hello to their friends, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot more kind of action on the factory floor with conflicts developing, stuff like that. And Ford is, is slowly losing control over, over his workers. They're not leaving, but they are starting to start trouble, you know? So, um, so, so lucky him, there's this guy named, named Harry Bennett. Harry Bennett is a 24 year old sailor. Who's also a naval boxer and, uh, and a complete fucking psycho. And basically <laughs> one of Ford's friends happens to be driving through New York, uh, one, one night and notices this dude getting into this like street fight and, uh, and the cops came and, and arrested him. So this guy, his name is uh, Bernie Gares, hops out of the car and like waves down the cops. The cops know him cause he's like a pro cop journalist there in the city and, uh, yeah. says like, let me, let me take Harry here. I think I got a friend for him. You know, the cops let, let him me take Harry here. I think I got a friend for him. He's got moxie. I like the cut of his jib. He's a go getter. <laughs> uh, so, so he takes, he takes go getter Harry to see Henry Ford because, you know, Gary's is a friend of Ford's. He's aware that Ford's having trouble on the factory floor and thinks that like Harry Bennett might have a new, you know, managerial style for him, you know? So Gary's and Bennett, um, meet Ford. They, they talk about, you know, Bennett's background in the military and all this stuff. And, uh, he's got no business experience. Of course, he's just like a, you know, a fucking a dude. Yeah. <laughs> street fighting psycho. So according Which to the a legend, lot of people back then, everybody oh, yeah, was like yeah, it wasn't. fucking like well, boxing and like doing crazy ass shit, like being the fuck out of each other. That's yes. That's going to be a big fuck, part yeah. of what happens right now, actually. So, so, uh, according to the legend, um, Henry Ford asks Harry Bennett only one question, and that is, 
can you shoot? <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and uh, I, I, in my mind, like, I like thinking that maybe Harry answered him by like giving him like two finger guns, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question? You know, something like that. <laughs> but anyway, he was in and Harry uh, got an office. Uh, he was supposed to run security for the factory floor. He got this little office where like, every day, with a revolver or an air gun, depending on who's writing, he would practice. Um, he would do target practice inside the office while the workers were working down there as like an intimidation tactic. And uh, eventually, um, Harry uh, gets um, a bunch of his buddies, thugs, uh, gangsters, like actual like river gangsters. They're called boxers and football players and wrestlers, etc to like uh, come and become this like uh, this force inside the factory floor and keep the workers in line. So uh, Harry and these hench Mendersons were hired to run the plant security. But then in 21, Bennett was given like an official position in an office called the service department. And mm-hmm. Bennett ran the service department, which would be called Ford's Gestapo later. Um, uh, this 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 uh, department was eight thousand people strong. Like these are eight thousand like thugs and hooligans that would like comb through the the factory floor and keep everybody in line. They would like freely beat workers on the floor or in the street. It didn't fucking matter. Um, and uh, and even worse, on top of that. The, the service department incentivized another 9,000 workers to act as stool pigeons for the department and inform on their fellow workers. So at the time, if you were working in a Ford factory on your break, this was like a dangerous moment to talk to a, another worker about anything. So they would like performatively talk sports in really loud voices just in case like one of these guys would roll up on them for no reason and start whipping them for like conspiring and shit like that. I mean, I'd imagine that... Um that Ford was probably pretty concerned with any kind of like labor subversion going on at the time. I mean, this is also uh, the first red scare era. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is where kind of the U S labor movements almost at its peak. Right. I mean, well, it's it's struggling everywhere. It's uh, this is, I would say like, um, yeah, that's true in Detroit. It's uh, the movement is still, it, all right, it's big, but I wouldn't say it's like united. It's not. It's not entirely organized, and like union salts in the factory are having a very hard time. You know, pr- because there's a nine thousand strong army against them. Also, but uh, right. but at the time, like um, yeah, Ford was scared of the communists, and he he was kind of. <laughs> uh, Kind of right to be because uh, communist organizers put together this thing in, um, this is a bit later now. This is, uh, what is this? Um, 32 now, right? So we're mm. in the Great Depression, unemployment, massive. Um, and uh, the the communist party in Detroit uh, puts together this thing called the unemployed councils. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know this? All right. So yeah, this they is, did this in, in a lot of places actually, yeah. Okay. All right. So this this becomes like a famous uh, event in in Ford history, and it, and it makes Bennett like kind of who he is too. Um, mm-hmm. So so yeah. So basically, there's four hundred thousand unemployed people in Michigan. The Communist Party pulls together the unemployed councils, and they bring together something between three and five thousand people to um, do like a protest march. From these are unemployed people. This is a this is you know. A, yeah. yeah. So to do a protest march from Detroit to Ford's hometown in Dearborn, where the, like the new factory is and all this, it's it's fully built now. It's fucking massive. Um, mm-hmm. So the protesters put together fourteen basic demands that they wanted to like peacefully present to Henry Ford, and then like split, and that was the big plan. And it includes like rehiring plans, health care, uh, an end to racial discrimination in hiring specifically, um, a budget of winter fuel for unemployed people, the abolition of all the spies and the hooligans. And stuff and also of course the right to organize at the plant uh so of course you know ford sends harry bennett to go and like clean this mess up and the marchers on their way get met by this phalanx of cops uh the police start immediately tear gassing these guys and assaulting them with clubs so this goes on for a little while and then one of the officers fires a gun into the protesters who scatter into the fields grab a bunch of stones and begin like lobbing these stones at the uh, at the police and um the after a little while of this kind of back and forth they the protesters get back together, continue their march. And when they almost reach the factory, they're met by two fire trucks on an overpass uh, over them as they're marching who like, un, you know, unload their like high pressured water hoses on the protesters. 
They move a little bit through that, and they're once again met by cops and Bennett's like service department, like heavies, you know, uh, like a, a ton of them who just <laughs> fucking straight up open fire into this crowd. They kill three people right off the bat. Twenty people are wounded with with gunshots, and uh, the leaders of the march signal a retreat. Um, but Bennett hops into his car, like chases them down, firing his gun out of the window of this car uh, at, at people. And so the marchers start throwing rocks again. They manage to hit Bennett. He gets out of the car and starts shooting into the crowd even more. And on top of that, you've got his like boys up on the up on the overpass with the cops now. They all have machine guns and they just start fucking spraying the crowd as they're trying to retreat in which like another uh, few people get killed in the end, like something like four people are dead. Um, but like 60 some 60 to 70 people are like, have, you know, gunshot wounds and various other wounds. And then when they're hospitalized, these workers who got shot and beat on, they get handcuffed to their beds and a lot of them get arrested. N- obviously like none of Bennett's people get arrested. None of the cops, of mm-hmm. course, not anything like that. Um, and, uh, and this, this event kicks off organized unionization in Detroit and in like a huge way. And it suddenly mm-hmm. accelerates there are now like stronger unions, etc. cetera. Um, and it's called the Ford massacre. Uh, among other names, this is what it's called, and this was followed in uh, uh, in almost no time at all, like maybe five years later, by uh, another kind of uprising. And at this time, you have um, these unions a lot stronger. The United Auto Workers Union has been invented, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. led by Walter Ruther, who's um, who's you know pretty cool. And uh, he manages to salt like thousands of uh, these workers at this Ford complex, and picks like the shift change. To, to do this huge walkout strike, like 9,000 people or whatever. And mm-hmm. while, and the whole thing is just, a, it's okay, it's kind of a, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a good demand. Like the, the point is to make a six hour work day for an $8 a day wage. That was the, the, the idea. And that's it. That was the one issue for this thing. So as Ruther and his like co organizers are talking to press who have their cameras out, you know, who are like, you know, I don't know, clicking putting the new plates back and doing it again and that kind of thing <laughs> as they're taking pictures um 40 of bennett's goons come up behind them they're in the photo and start like whooping on these on these on these protesters on these workers um one of them gets their back broken uh another one one of the co-organizers this guy whose actual name is frankenstein gets thrown down the steps and all of this yeah yeah it's but but the, apparently what bennett's goons really like to do is kick people in the balls so i don't know imagine this like chaotic scene of like people just getting like booted in the groin and like having their shirts pulled over them and beaten then it said kick them in the balls that's right (laughs) that's right uh yeah so that's the kind of chaos that bennett like uh, on you know did they call them balls in the 20s or they had some other yeah that's it yeah i don't know probably give them the old bennett method (laughs) (laughs) kick them in the bennett's that's what they call them (laughs) (laughs) right in the brass bennett's um yeah so so basically, this damaged Ford's reputation even more than it already was. We'll talk about what really got to his reputation, but uh, but this was kind of like the nail on the coffin for Ford's like really anti-union um, power, I guess. And he ended up having to let the UAW organize inside the the union, inside the the plant, and everything. Um, but just like one last word about this Bennett guy, and then we'll get to the anti-Semitism. But Bennett had <laughs> nobody knows nobody knows how much this guy was paid. You know, he's like a squat dude. He wears this like bow tie because he claims like, you know, in a street fight, they can pull on the the cravat, you know, and like blah, blah, blah. But he's right. So that's why skinheads are skinheads. So you can't pull their hair and stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He he owned tigers and lions, which he would occasionally bring to work, apparently, as like, I guess, an intimidation thing. He would also let them wander around his like mansions, which I'm going to tell you about right now. Um, Mm -hmm. So (laughs) this guy. Nobody knew how much money he had. Yeah, but he's got tons of property, like huge amounts of property. Um, and uh, and this is like, but we do know this is Ford's guy. Like Ford even tried to give Bennett the company. He tried to make him like the inheritor of Ford and only because of his of Ford's relatives did that not go through. You know, like Ford loved this man. He was on the board of directors. So wait, he just wanted to know? give this like guy who's good at 
like beating people up like can you shoot ford water coming <laughs> yeah yeah, it's a, yeah he, he they loved him he adored him like bennett would be at ford's house every single morning for two straight years just to see you know if he could do anything for him you know i mean this is yeah this ford is had very interesting like close friends he did yeah we're getting to more of those too yeah um mm. but just real quick and last also thing about bennett some of them who are like very will be important for the rest of our arc in at least in their influence and will be mentioned at least one or two more episodes absolutely yeah this yeah. this is a con like a complex web but it really is a web yeah um so so bennett one of his many properties was this lodge uh which was really a fortress it had a moat surrounding it that inside the water were pointed sticks and then the bridge (laughs) that crossed over that pointed stick moat was set with dynamite that he could trigger in case i guess of a worker invasion or something. Um, he had multiple guard towers. He and steps inside, like the steps in this fortress that would like lead him down to like his boat where he could escape and shit. They were unevenly built so that only he could like memorize how to run down them in case he was being pursued. Uh, he had guns hidden in walls in pretty much every room. He had um, like a room in the center of the house where all the ventilation to all the other rooms would meet in this one room so he could spy on eavesdrop on all of his guests and stuff. And I think the creepiest thing, though, is probably this gigantic glass window that he had that looked out into uh, a pool um, so he could watch women swim like during parties and stuff. So of course he would have that shit. Of course. Yeah. And, and so naturally the boy scouts bought it in 1964. I think it's, it suits them <laughs> perfectly. Um, so, so what the scout master could watch the little boy swim and shit. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm just saying they bought it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, with all the hidden passages and transparent walls and shit and, eavesdropping places so that's it so i mean without ford so wait, like the, this guy the, would be the fucking hung still and, exists oh yeah yeah it's people some now? very nice people bought it in like the 80s and did a little tour of it and stuff um hmm. yeah they, they they said that their kids love all the secret passages I'm like what are you doing this place is like armed and booby trapped like don't let your fucking kids run around in this uh but whatever look mommy i found a stick of dynamite from the 20s yeah, yeah. And you know what? And none of this fucking helped because in that very house, he he actually did get shot. He he survived, sadly, but he uh, some dude did get in there and shoot him. So all that for nothing. Uh, guns back in the day sucked, too. Like, uh, That's the, true. Berkman, Berkman fucking tried to cap. Dude, he poisoned uh, a bullet Frick, like and he, it didn't work. He shot Frick, what, like th- like two, three times? It was all just of like, the times. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. He's fine. Freeze, do yeah, you know yeah, yeah. Who, who shot him? Who shot? Oh, no, I couldn't find who it. Shot I couldn't you. find it anywhere. Yeah, I, I doubt it went well for him, but I'm I'm very interested. So maybe the listener mm. might know mm. more about that. But please let us know because I was I was looking. Um, so that's it. So that's basically Ford the capitalist, like how he dealt with labor. Um, that's the idea. So let's go to part two, right? Let's go to let's go to the. I, I called this section introducing the new Ford Fuhrer. <laughs> um, and, uh, I think this is really where Henry most interacts with the rest of this arc, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, also, so, this, I mean, the first part is, I think, very relevant. I think this is... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah, I mean, they're basically the same thing for for the purposes of having a kind of coherent episode. We have two parts, but that's basically kind of all mixed up, no? Into- oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, this, this, these are happening also at the same time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so right. we, we basically went from like the 1913 ish and ended with, uh, the battle of the overpass, which would have been 37, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to go back to the 1920s and then jump to the forties and that'll be the episode. So now the part called Henry Ford, the psycho Nazi. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. The all new. Ford Fuhrer. So uh, let's start with something that happened really recently. There, there was a. Um, this is a little like local Dearborn history. Um, the mayor of Dearborn. This is just last year. Fired the the lead editor for their like Dearborn historical journal that was run through I think their historical museum or something there, and the the guy was fired because um, on the front of it, it had a picture of Henry Ford where there's a quote of him just saying something horribly anti-Semitic, and the whole issue was about like Ford's anti-Semitism. So the Dearborn mayor, who is like known to be like a progressive figure in the town, like. Like um like pro refugee and stuff like this like well, Dearborn, pulled the issue and fired him you know yeah I mean Dearborn for maybe out uh, listeners outside the United States is the largest Arab community in 
the United States, um, both Christians and Muslims, but it's the largest Arab community huh. in, in the entirety of the United States. All right. Um, so anyway, this is this is for Bill McGraw. This is your ultimate revenge, I hope. Uh, so you're going from a, a... The joke was that like if the Dearborn mayor didn't fire this guy, nobody would have heard about this journal at all. Like It has a subscription basis of like 17 people on Earth, you know? <laughs> and then like the, the local news bumped the article and reprinted it. And so uh, we're, I'm just going to carry the torch, you know? We're just going to keep it going. All right. It's for you, Bill. So um, yeah, I'm guessing like most or a lot of our listeners anyway, probably have, like we said, some passing knowledge about uh, Henry Ford's attitude towards the Jews. Um, So let's go back now to that peace voyage he took. Yeah. Back uh, Mm in 1917 Mm -hmm. or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Um, His speech about German and Jewish bankers. Right. That he supposedly made to everybody, including a few Jews on the boat. Okay. 1921. Uh, he's had a little time to let the story kind of grow in his mind, right? So he he's interviewing a New York Times reporter in 21, and Ford gives his own new account of this trip. He says, It was the Jews themselves who convinced me of the direct relationship between the international Jew and war. In fact, they went out of their way to convince me. On the peace ship were two very prominent Jews. We had not been at sea 200 miles before they began telling me of the power of the Jewish race, of how they controlled the world through their control of gold, and that the Jew and no one but the Jew could end the war. I was reluctant to believe it, but they went into detail to convince me of the means by which the Jews controlled the war, and how they had the money, how they had cornered all the basic materials needed to fight the war, and all that. And they talked so long and so well that they convinced me. They said that they believed that the Jews started the war, and that they would continue it as long as they wished, and until the Jews stopped the war, it could not be stopped. I was so disgusted, I would have liked to have turned back the ship. So, (laughs) why is he an anti-Semite? The Jews convinced him. That's why. Yeah. He didn't want to believe it, but, yeah. He really, yeah, very reluctant. But um, that's a, uh, so it's a very different I mean, story. Isn't that, it? <laughs> that's the same trip where he had his anti-Semitic speech, and the, the yes. Jews were dis- the, disgusted by it. Who were there? But yeah, like why but were no, they disgusted? In, in his basically? narrative, like yeah, yeah. they were like you know just they had just left port, and he's like, uh, "Hey Henry, we control the world." <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't say it. I'm reluctant. I'm so reluctant. <laughs> I'll need some convincing. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. probably how it went down yeah. yeah uh so but why was the new york times even asking uh, henry ford about jews at all well in uh january of 1919 this is around the time he was like putting together ford fordlandia just in context you know uh mm-hmm. our our boy bought the dearborn independent newspaper and he forms the dearborn publishing company and he makes this like super huge piece of shit named uh, ernest liebold the general manager of this paper and he gets himself a couple of writers the most important one being a man named bill cameron who uh, ray and i were reading up mm-hmm. on a little bit today actually mm-hmm. bill cameron's going to come back when we talk about christian identity because uh while he was developing his celebrity here through ford as as like a writer um and as a guy that was like becoming increasingly well known, he was also kind of what a proto Christian identitarian, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he will devil definitely come up when we talk about Christian identity. But before that, we'll do an episode on something called British Israelism. Yeah, uh, which is so you wonder why we'll we'll do uh, an episode focused on American fascism that's called British Israelism, but <laughs> yeah. it's because um, this is an ideology that has its roots in the, I mean, as a movement, it was formed in the late 19th century Britain, but it had its own like, American, an American focused um, offshoot. And so this guy, mm. uh, William Cameron, was one of the leaders of the British Israelism movement in the United States. And he was one of the figures that were kind of really instrumental in sh- um, uh, enabling the evolution of American British Israelism into what was later Christian identity. 
largely and, because of what goes mm-hmm. down in this in this journal in this newspaper. Yes, I don't. I mean, he, so in that regard, he's very he's an important figure in this arc. I would say. I mean, so I mean, uh, we'll do a whole episode of British uh, about British Israelism, but just to say that I mean, this whole ideology is based on a simple idea, and that the, the Anglo-Saxons are the direct genetic descendants of the yeah. ten lost tribes of ancient Israel. Right, and therefore are yeah. the, you know the people of God, um, and uh, and actually the modern Jews are are kind of um, in, in different versions of it are related to them, uh, but uh, kind of lost their racial purity by intermixing with other races and nations. So the Anglo Saxons are really the uh, the true ancient Israelites, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and so they are different. We'll discuss all, all of these details about this, uh, but what uh, people like William Cameron and a few others did was they tied this. Um, uh, ideology to the the right wing and made it even more kind of overtly and openly anti-Semitic. Yes. Um, and focused mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. on anti-Semitism. So the, the guy is interesting because he was he was one of the leaders of the American British Israelite movement and he was the president of something which was called the Anglo-Saxon Federation of America, which was the main mm-hmm. uh, British Israelism focused organization. And he was the leader of it throughout the 1930s. Uh, and a member of it un- until it stopped existing, I think, in 1945 or something like that. But yeah. he, at the same time, he was also a close collaborator and a personal friend of Henry Ford and working for him uh, from the period of 1918 uh, until 1946. Um, and uh, was supposed, uh, he's supposed to be the guy who ghost uh most of Henry Ford's and uh, the worst anti-Semitic uh, mm-hmm. articles. Yeah, so exactly. he's he's a guy who's like the the main anti-Semitic basically author of the time in America, or maybe one of the main uh, uh, the most influential ones, and is the leader of this uh, British Israelism uh, weirdo kind of movement that's moving more into becoming what we know as Christian identity. Yeah, and he managed to get something like 10 articles specifically on British Israelism into the Dearborn Independent, yeah. uh, and, and that's kind of how they made this link. Yeah. Just to mention, he, he's the guy who, like, for example, gave an interview in which he said, I think, that the Bible is a racial book. Um, yes, and yeah. and it's basically oh, yeah. a story of we'll the Anglo-Saxon see, yeah, we'll race see that from James Mason later. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah exactly. It's yeah. way yeah. back. So that, that when James Mason says something like that, it really has roots in in a, in an ideology that you know was kind of founded in the 19th century Britain, and then pretty early on, already in the 19th century, moved into America and had its own version, which was really focused specifically on America and its role uh, in this, like you know history of the the ancient israelites yeah yeah so that's bill cameron that's the writer here the yeah. the the gm as i mentioned is a man named ernest Leibold, um which is a, a hilarious name considering what he does uh like his <laughs> name is lie and bold and that's it Ooh. ah you know yeah. i don't know or, maybe, or, or, maybe or it sounds kind of like libel too sounds maybe. a bit like libel it really does yeah. maybe i should i just i didn't point out one important fact about cameron and that's that yeah. he was he had an office right next to henry ford uh for most of this period more than 20 years when he worked for him he had like a lunch lunch with him every day mm-hmm. and his wife uh and he was his main pr guy because henry ford had right. problems with talking with Henry you know, Ford could not communicate yeah. like at so all. Yeah. He he kind of did that for him. He was his PR guy. Yeah. And an executive at the Ford company. So at the same time mm-hmm. while being all of this that we mentioned. Yeah. So so libeled the the GM. Um I'm going to read a, just a small excerpt from this uh, pretty great historian named Donald Warren. Uh, who I'm going to use a lot when we talk about Charles Coughlin. Libel and, and this guy Coughlin knew each other, but that's a much later story. But uh, so this is this is this is Libel, described by one historian as a squat, heavy set, bull necked man with short short cropped hair. He was an enthusiastic supporter of New Germany, a devout Lutheran. He seemed to epitomize the modern Prussian military man. At dinner time, his eight children would march around. 
around the table in military style, and no one could sit down until he gave the word. Yes. Within the company, Leibold was certainly the main influence, pressing Henry Ford towards a sympathetic view of Nazi Germany. And on one occasion at a festive event, he passed out miniature Nazi swastika flags to Ford personnel at like the fucking Christmas party or something like this. Uh, so that's that's who's running this paper with Ford. Um, <coughs> So you've got a feel for this guy, right? So Ernst Leibold was more than just the general manager. Ernst Leibold was like the the kind of like Ford's spy master, but not not spying on his employees, but spying on like the Jews, like all of them. This was Leibold's job at uh-huh. the paper. And Leibold maintained a network of spies, and a lot of them um, came from like military intelligence and stuff, like ex-intelligence officers and things like this mm. uh so they were tasked uh to like spy on the jews libeled was of course especially interested in new york city and uh his agents would feed him this like, let's call it information who would then pass it on to ford who would then sit down with cameron and they would like bang out a new hit piece essentially every week for the dearborn independent now it's not entirely clear um how much of these writings are like, how much do we credit them to Ford? How much do we credit them to Cameron or other writers? But uh, in short, pretty much everybody who was anywhere near the Dearborn Independent was really clear about Ford having, like, total oversight over everything, like he did with everything. You know, yeah. that's mm-hmm. his thing. Um, so on May 22nd, yeah. Ford publishes the first, like, big anti-Semitic rants in this paper. And then that just goes on for Two straight years, like uninterrupted. And uh, some historians have said that this is like the the longest, most sustained single attack on Jews in like centuries. And in the first couple of weeks, Ford claims that the Jews were plotting to take over baseball. I think that's in like the opening article, (laughs) Uh, taking over Broadway, American agriculture, whatever. And um, uh, and of course, most famously, republishing the protocols of the learned elders of Zion in like weekly supplements in this magazine. Um, This magazine had massive distribution uh, and it went like Ford dealerships even would like put copies of it in new Ford cars as they sold them and shit like that. Like it was fucking everywhere. And the protocols had just taken like a serious hit to their legitimacy and they weren't really well known in the US. But I I mean, they're about to be, they become like the other most Mm -hmm. popular anti-Semitic texts in the US after this. But but there was just like reportage from the UK uh, showing that these were forgeries as we know them to be and their like their true background as essentially anti-Semitic propaganda to like foment pogroms and shit like that. And um, yeah, so that was known. That was in the English speaking world and people that kept track of this knew. So like when he talked to reporters, reporters knew this automatically about the protocols. Yeah. Um, so... So, like, an instance is uh, Ford is pressed by a reporter when he starts to republish these protocols, and they ask him, like, hey, you realize this is a forgery, right? And Ford gives this answer that also Cameron gives an almost identical answer, I notice, when he gets asked this stuff from people, which is, like, I don't know, forgeries or not forgeries, whatever. All I know is that they fit what's going on. That's what Ford would say. No matter what they are, they Hmm. fit. Yeah, so William Cameron in 1950s, he said, um, well, they say it's a forgery, but what do they mean by forgery? Like, maybe mm-hmm. it's like maybe it's a fictional text, but like it describes exactly what happened. So, w- what does it mean, like forgery, something? Like that. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, already by spring of twenty one, uh, a bunch of like former presidents and like American luminaries make this big public petition denouncing the Independent and this like a uh, kind of big time lawyer and also Jewish advocate from New York City named Louis Marshall. Uh, he telegrams Ford personally to say that these these constitute like a libel upon the entire people. To which the Dearborn Independent <laughs> responds with a telegram that says, "Your rhetoric is that of a Bolshevik orator." You know, <laughs> just really driving that point. <laughs> so after the independent had been running these for a while libeled and his lieutenant start to package all of them into these into volumes um uh, into eventually like this four volume text called the international jew which i mentioned before this huge monstrous 
series of texts. Mm -hmm. Which is still republished by Nazis today and read and... Yeah. Well, Ford um, really wanted that. He specifically did not copyright this text for this for this explicit purpose of it being republishable uh, mm -hmm. easily and spread around the world. So it, like 12, it's in 12 languages already in like the 20s. You know what I mean? Like this is a, this is a big fucking book. And it, uh, I think most importantly, though, it becomes pretty popular in Germany specifically to one guy that we all know named Adolf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, shit. He's a big, big fan. So before we get to this, like, Ford Hitler slash nonfiction mm -hmm. uh, part of the story, let's just look at what's in this book for a minute. Um, so keep in mind that this is mostly Ford's, like, update on the protocols. So there's not, like, a lot of, like, super original stuff in here, but there are some gems. Uh, the, the story, according to Ford... Um, of the whole conspiracy starts with Christopher Columbus. And somehow the expulsion of the Jews from Spain is part of some grander plot to conquer, uh, to create America in some way. Um, hmm. He's got like what he thinks are like historical references for this, of course. Um, and then he just jumps to, to, to like the 1830s, 40s, where he claims that the Jewish population went from like a bunch of people on the boat with Christopher Columbus to 3.3 million in the 1840s, which so is wait, he thinks like Cortez fundamentally not true. were like Jews or something. Like <laughs> I don't, he didn't mention, he did not mention Cortez. Uh, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll peek into the four volume version and we'll, we'll see, but uh, maybe it's in there somewhere. But like in reality, this number is like kind of crazy, you know, like in his own time, the, 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 the census reported that the total population of Jews in America was like 3.8 million. Right. That's like, as he's writing this and he's claiming like a hundred years before it was that same number pretty much. And then he says that who even knows how many Jews there are today, you know, but if, like the census has the census knows they count, you know, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, he gives this huge list of all the industries controlled by the Jews. The motion picture industry, the sugar industry, the tobacco industry, 50% or more of the meatpacking industry, over 60% of the shoemaking industry, most of the musical purveying done in the country, jewelry, grain, cotton, oil, steel, <laughs> magazine authorship, news distribution, the liquor business, the loan business, to name only a few. <laughs> the shoes. They've got the <laughs> shoes, guys. Fuck. Uh, so I think he starts to feel a little bit like self-owned. As he's giving this list, because, you know, mm. that's him. Like, he's he's the super monopolistic and imperialist capitalist. You know, he's the yeah. one that controls, like, every little bit of his industry. Um, so he makes a distinction between about conflating, like, prosperity with control. He says that Gentiles can be pros prosperous, but they're not in control. The, the Jews are oh. organized in a way that Gentiles have never been. So then in like a follow up to this, Ford goes like totally like Silicon Valley TED talk on us. And he does this whole article about makers and builders, you know, <laughs> about being a maker. Um, so uh, so of course, so that's opposed to like getters. So he says that the Jews have convinced American workers to become getters and not makers. So um, this is his definition of uh of a getter right um it doesn't matter what he does so long as the income is satisfactory he has no illusions sentiments or affections on the side of work it is the gold that counts the joy of creative labor is nothing to him not even an intelligible saying and then he claims that like farmers raise crops for the inherent love of crops <laughs> like this is his this is so it's it's unalienated labor i guess is what he's kind of yeah, saying because like fordism is like synonymous with like joyful labor oh yes yeah, yes that's, indeed. that's what uh -huh. it's all about yeah. right yeah he's but that's what he's convinced himself of you know he's yeah. like run his employees through their re-education program and now they're all still yeah. there so they must love it right but yeah. except for those dirty unionists who go around telling everybody this completely jewish lie that yeah. their work means you know nothing and they wouldn't know that if nobody <laughs> told them um i mean ford also tells them this <laughs> here you are a battery <laughs> you're a blood yeah. battery for my machine um so uh, he so he challenges Jews then to um, to show to prove that their system is superior. Um, 
uh, and then he says, like, until they can prove this to me personally, the charge of being an alien, destructive and treasonable influence will have to stand. Which isn't that that's like Ford on college campuses doing like a, a Steven Crowder thing. Yeah, this is like a yeah. Prove yeah. me wrong. <laughs> you know, like this is that. Um, what a dick. But if Jews controlled all that, then they already prove him wrong. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> uh, well. I, Boris, um, it's not a fair fight the, because the Jews control the media and the schools and apparently also the churches. So he, he's like, uh, that's his major complaint here is that we're never going to know who's better because the Jews like rigged the whole system, you know, which um, makes them better. Right. I, uh, I don't know. Well, it's, it's- that's if you're a getter, you know, but if you're a maker. Hmm. No, better is the joy of your position. <laughs> right? I see. Yeah, yeah. Makers. Um, so, interestingly, but not surprisingly, uh, a lot of his articles quote Jewish nationalists, but in, like, completely uh-huh. ludicrous contexts, you know, uh, to make the point that Jews themselves don't even want to be Americans, that they love ghettos. Um, and, it, you know, and then in the same text where he's talking about how... Uh, Jews have a nationalist movement essentially is what he's saying um, right. he then just reminds everybody because that sounds like normal he reminds everybody that they're also responsible for every war ever made <laughs> you know what I mean so right. uh, he, he, and he says like he does one of these like well actually he does he says um, what is it uh, well actually Jews are not persecuted on religious grounds because they are a nation and a race so that that doesn't stick buddy you know, and then makes fun of Jews who claim that they're escaping religious persecution because he quotes some like Zionist or ever who says that, you know, Jews are a separate uh-huh. race and blah, blah, blah. Um, he considers all mass immigration a Jewish business model, remembering again that like 56% of his workforce is immigrant, like immigration for Ford is a business model, you know. And then and also like immigrants who also didn't necessarily want to be Americans either. Uh, well, they shouldn't I mean, have gotten a, to the a, melting that's a, that's a pot, big, Boris. That's, that's that's a big thing in like immigrant communities in the US at the time is that they didn't think of themselves as Americans they thought of themselves as whatever the fuck they were. Yeah, and the people using the word American the most were like nativists and shit, you know. It's not like right. hey, welcome kind of word, you know. Um yeah. He, so he reminds everybody that the Jews at this time have no nation state. And so that means they could be coming from anywhere, you know, very like they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. So Ford uh, laments uh, about the expulsion of the Jews from Poland, saying that Poland was given an unfair, <laughs> an unfair, uh, whatever, criticism here. He says that her sole crime was that she wished to save herself from the Jews. Uh, and to prevent war, which clearly didn't work for Poland. And also, it turns out it wasn't the Jews that ended up invading Poland at all, funnily enough. Who was that again that invaded Poland? It wasn't the Jews. That's what you think. I don't remember. I don't remember who it was. Um, they had to invade Poland to prevent the Jews from destroying ah, Germany. That's right. That's right. Come on, Fritz. Yes. You know this. Well, actually... Get with the Bo- program. But, but yeah, Boris, but actually that, that is kind of what he ends up saying because he then does, he basically then lives like a list of reasons why Jews are responsible for all of their own oppression. Yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah. So on the relationship to the Jew to the Gentile, he says, um, well, okay, that the Jew is always automatically against the Gentile, no matter how nice a Gentile is. He writes that um, mm-hmm. the Jew was... Uh, uh, a Republican is against the monarchy. A socialist is against the Republic. And a Bolshevist against the socialist. Which to me makes no fucking sense. Like, what is the point he's trying to say here? Is it that, do, do, does, what, the, like, do Jewish things become Gentile? And then because they're Gentile, the Jews have to make up, like, a new thing? Like, I guess that's the idea. I don't get it. But despite this making, like, no sense at all, he takes a lot of pains to explain why it's happening. And uh, and apparently it's, it's all because Jews are racially autocratic and they use democracy as a front to cover this autocracy. Um, and no matter where they are, they'll form an aristocracy. So a lot of autocracy is going on here. Henry also mm-hmm. makes a difference between uh, conversations that his spies tell him about, like, where he believes he's got this, like, inside 
decide. Well, okay, he makes a distinction between what Jews say to each other and what Jews say to Gentiles. And he says with the Gentiles, it's all socialism and democracy. But when they talk together, they're like, you know, they're wringing their fingers and petting white cats. And, right. You know, it's plotting the, 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 they might the look like you and me, but in fact, uh, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in fact, they're Bond villains. What's, what's Bond? Yeah. But here's the thing. He's fascinated by the New York uh, Are you? I don't know if you're familiar with this organization from the, the 20. It's very interesting. I, I'm okay. not. All right. No. So so basically, just in short, the New York Kikila was a response from the Jewish community to combat uh, Jewish organized crime and also corrupt police uh, that were also causing trouble in this community, right? And so it drew together like a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. Also known as the police. Yeah. Also known as the police. <laughs> yes. Um, so so Ford sees a bunch of Jews getting together and automatically says that it's a government within a government and says that like Kahila uh, translates as government. It doesn't. It translates as congregation or community, apparently. But uh, so and so he begins to obsessively, you know, talk about the Kahila. And, and the thing is, is like he for sure, for sure followed the internal like discussions going on in uh, in these like not internal i mean they they published their their convention notes and stuff like that mm -hmm. but they publish it for a jewish audience like it'll show up in a jewish paper for instance or something like that it's like jews talking to jews most of the time and um and that's where you know ford says that that's where the real truth comes out you know so see how deep this conspiracy goes let see how sneaky that these jews are that this is a conversation they had with each other right so keep in mind the kahila is the new autocratic government within a government that's going to take over the police that's going to be oppressing gentiles in no time and that is like profoundly anti-democratic because democracy is something they only say to gentiles they never say it to each other here's what the kahila says to themselves about this um the European notion of an all-controlling, police-regulated, all-possessing Kahila cannot strike root on American soil. This is first because the idea of the Kahila has come in late in the development of Jewish life here, and also because the European Kahila is not in consonance with the free and voluntary character of American religious, social, educational, and philanthropic enterprises. The American Kahila cannot have and should not seek to have police or taxing power. The only power the Kahila can exercise is moral, spiritual in its nature, the power of an enlightened public opinion, the power of a developed community sense it must be clear therefore that the tequila the tequila i wanted to say should exercise physical control over no institution whatsoever so how deep does this conspiracy go that three years before ford was publishing this shit in the dearborn independent they knew that libel was going to be reading their internal communications and then made uh like a fake statement about you know not wanting to be authoritarian incredible this basically yeah. proves it very sneaky. Yeah. Very sneaky. Yeah. Um, so he, it also goes without saying that like he was obsessed with the American Jewish committee, which he saw as like a colonial effort to set up like Jewish elites all over the country. And uh, the New York City Kilo would be like its capital or something like this. Um, yeah, that's the idea. So the gem yeah. of this whole thing, though. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I just want to say that the tequila the, the that you mentioned is the Mexican secret government, I guess. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, oh, that's a great idea. I've got some Mexican secret government right here. Uh, oh, shit. All right. But the so the gem, I think, of this whole thing, though, is his own meditations on the, the Jewish protocols, as he calls them, right? So they're getting published. They're being printed as they are. Um, but um, he, let's see. I just want to read like one quote from this. Okay. So, so responding to the question of whether or not they're forgeries, he gives us like real head scratchers, you know, like really compelling arguments like this. Um, if it was fake, wouldn't they say we're Jewish all the time? <laughs> like this is, this is kind of what it comes down to. He says like only those who really know about Jewish culture could like possibly understand that this was written by Jews because they say they're going after the Gentiles on like every page and that they occasionally say that they're Jews like outright. And then mm -hmm. also um, that they talk a lot about autocracy, which of course we know that Jews love. So mm -hmm. that's how he figured out that they're probably real. So he writes, 
Uh, whosoever was the mind that conceived them, possessed a knowledge of human nature, of history, of statecraft, which is dazzling in its brilliant completeness, and terrible in the objects which it turns its powers. If indeed one mind alone conceived them, it is too terribly real for fiction, too well sustained for speculation, too deep in its knowledge of the secret springs of life for a forgery. <laughs> so there's, that's the end of that. Um, I mean, I don't know, have you guys read the protocols? Have you read these? I Obviously. did a very long time ago. Yeah. yeah, I did as well. It's like a teenager tried to write like his own Bond film. That's what it, that's what it's like. They're really uh, yeah. Yeah, like, it's like um or you know a, a forgery from the Russian Empire. Yes, that's what they are. The <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, like yeah, like some, clearly some like you really have to be a moron to believe. You really have to be a fucking idiot. Yeah, you have to be fucking yes. stupid. Yeah. So. but uh, I guess running like an international empire is not as hard as it looks. <laughs> This guy is dumb. So much like he knew how to plant rubber trees in Brazil, you know, uh, he was like, he also knew that this was clearly not a forgery from all his expertise. Um, so that tells you something about American success, I think. Also, Henry Ford, totally not into autocracy. This is why he found a place <laughs> yes. called Fordlandia. Because yeah, yeah. Henry let's tally Henry. it up so far. Yeah. So yeah. let's see. And, um, and had like an all pervasive system that like invaded yes. the yeah. personal lives of every single yeah. one of his workers. Yes. And it's, uh, <laughs> networks of spies, uh, monopolistic control over mm -hmm. multiple industries. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's I mean, he, more. He, his name is synonymous with the, like a. Uh, uh, a system of control that didn't exist before that. Like yes, yes. I mean yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, and often in these in this like international Jew, he does really end up describing his own operations by accident, you know, mm. um, but saying that this is the Jewish conspiracy. Mm. Uh, he so basically just to end all that, he sells. But Fritz, he's doing that to counter the Jewish conspiracy. It's different. Okay. It's different. He's trying to organize us, like you know. Yeah. Okay. You know who. <laughs> the Armenians. Hmm. So Ford uh, sells two million copies of of this like four volume fucking set. Um, and back home, this leads to a general boycott of Ford Motors that forces the Dearborn Independent to stop publishing their anti-Semitic shit for a little while. And this is in 1922 now. So this is the same time he publishes his own autobiography where he like denies that he's ever been prejudiced against anybody. Uh, but he just can't keep his fucking mouth shut. And two years later, because of the farm workers movement, he cranks it back up again to attack this, the leader of this movement named Shapiro. And um, so in 27, well, it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice that people were able to organize a boycott around that, that, Seem to actually kind of work in some way, but right? But yeah, I mean, like Detroit was... That's, that's a positive in this little, in this story here, right? Yeah, there, there's a lot of like... And enough people were like, yeah, this is bullshit, fuck this. <laughs> this this is almost like Manichaean enough to be a partisan film. Like the, all the good guys in this are like anti-racist union organizers, you know? Like, uh, and then you've got this ultimate fucking i mean you can't get freak. much more evil than henry ford no he's really he's truly a, a fucking yeah. horrible person mm -hmm. so in in 1927 though he gets into a hilarious car accident um mm -hmm. is seriously injured <laughs> in it and and of course <laughs> of course because he never does anything wrong he's he, he does get into a couple car accidents in his life but he mm -hmm. he assumes that somebody's trying to kill him and that's the only possible explanation yeah. for why this who is trying to kill him? well right so here's what he does he God, somehow convinces probably. I don't think so. So he somehow convinces that New York Jewish lawyer that I mentioned before that he called a Bolshevik orator. He convinces Louis Marshall to write, to ghostwrite a letter of apology to like Jews everywhere for his anti-Semitic stuff. And uh, he publishes this. And nobody believes it. Like, everybody calls bullshit on this. Like, uh, this is, I think, uh, again, forgotten a lot when we talk about Henry Ford in America, is that a lot of people fucking hated this guy, you know? He yeah. was not, like, universally popular. This is, that came way later. And so in the 30s, um, the 30s came. Yeah, and the international Jew catches its second wind, and more unauthorized publications start popping up because it's not copyrighted. And then in an interview in 1931, um, just before he becomes chancellor, uh, he, or actually, when does he? Yeah, it is. Adolf gets interviewed by a Detroit news reporter based in Munich at the time. The reporter comes to interview Hitler and finds in his office a gigantic portrait of Henry Ford over Hitler's hmm. desk. And he asks him about this, and Hitler says that I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. And then, um, 
Damn. His historians of uh, David Lewis in particular claims that Hitler actually got a lot of what he said and wrote. His rhetoric came from the international Jew. And then even later at the Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials, this guy named Balder von Schirach, who was the uh, Der Reichsjugendführer, <laughs> um, he, he like was responsible for shipping thousands of Jews from Vienna to, to their deaths. He said, uh, you, you have no idea what the great, I can't do a German. I'll just say it. You have no idea what a great influence this book had on the thinking of German youth that this was like, yeah, you have no idea no, what yeah. a great influence this had on, on, the on thinking. Of, <laughs> thinking of German youth. Yeah, I'll say that is. Thank you. Yeah. It had to wake up. We've, we've left the Europe's now and now we are in yeah, the, uh, America. Fr Fritz has forgotten his. Yeah, I have. I have forgotten. <laughs> um, yeah. And also people are often, you know, they often like to remind us that like Ford sent like birthday money to Hitler and shit like that. They were somehow <laughs> funding the Nazis. Um, Don't but... spend it all in one place, Adolf. That's, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, there was Art. also a guy called, uh, a German guy called Kurt Ludecke. I don't know if you wanted to mention him, Fritz, but he was um, a German who lived in the U.S. in the 20s and 30s and was the official representative of the German Nazi party in the U.S. And he was a friend of Henry Ford and also a, a close friend of his main collaborator and ghostwriter and executive in the Ford company that we mentioned, uh, William Cameron, uh -huh. one of the founders of the Christian identity. He was like uh, close friends with him. He uh, he uh, later was a, like a dissident and an enemy of Hitler, uh, but in the twenties and thirties he was the representative of you know the Nazi Party, and hmm. yeah, a close collaborator of Henry Ford and his like main guys. Uh, well, that that takes us really nicely to the last little bit of this episode. So I wanted mm -hmm. to close it with um, Henry Ford's factory in Cologne in Germany. Mm -hmm. And this, oh. this was an interesting story that I really didn't know uh, anything about. Um, and so, so basically, at the onset of the Great Depression, yeah, Ford immediately fires half of his American workforce. And like weeks after this, he's in Cologne banging in like the foundation stone of a new factory there. Um, the first mm -hmm. factory he tried to do there was in Berlin. It didn't work out because nobody believed like that an American manufacturer could make good German quality cars. So it didn't work out. So he ended up trying to get some German associates to sort of go in on this with him. And who did he get? But uh, the largest firm in Europe at the time, IG Farben, whose later oh, work you yeah, might be yeah. familiar with having manufactured yeah, yeah. Zyklon, Zyklon B. B. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and also running like one of the largest slave labor camps like in history, you know? So, yeah. so in the 1920s, IG Farben was uh, a supporter of the German liberal party and the Nazis accused it of being an internationalist capitalist Jewish conspiracy as you do. Uh, but at the time that Ford got to Cologne, IG Farben had become one of the Nazis' most important donors and had begun like uh, publicly purging Jews from their ranks, which they actually finished up in 1938. And interestingly, the architect of this Cologne plant, this Ford plant that Ford was building with you know the support of IG Farben, was built by the same architect who designed this beautiful synagogue in Essen, and he decided to make this factory in the socialist Bauhaus style. So there's just some ironies mm -hmm. of architecture for, for our absolute nerdiest listeners. All right. So despite being under like total control of Ford and De Dearborn, uh, there, there, there was, I think, uh, a minority of German shareholders and a majority of American shareholders. Despite, despite this, it was being called like Ford, a German factory on a German river and stuff like this to really press that it's German, mm -hmm. German, 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 German. And this worked pretty well. He eventually like did wonderfully, um, becoming like the third most important auto manufacturer in Germany. So in 1937, okay, here's where it gets weird. So in 1937, for, well, not weird. Here's where it becomes incredibly predictable. But in 1937, Ford personally returns to Germany for the production of what would eventually become the Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, so he's not obviously mm. Volkswagen, but what he, he does is he builds it, he designs it essentially according to his own plans in concert with uh, Ferdinand Porsche's engineers. And, and But before it becomes the Beetle, Maybe some listeners might know this, but it makes a brief stop as the Wehrmacht's Kubelwagen, um, which is a, like a stylish, like military Jeep that you, you always see in every, like, it's the one you mostly see in films about Nazis. It's the, it's the cool looking like Jeep or sometimes like car that like the, the Gestapo will show up in or like the commanders uh -huh. will be brought to the field in. So he makes this and because of this, 
that's why uh, Henry Ford gets the highest uh, fucking medal of honor a foreigner can receive by Hitler in this fucking ceremony. And a, a lot, like people talk about that a lot. It became a big deal for Ford. Like he would show up on like strikers placards and stuff like that as this years went on. Like it wasn't a secret that Henry Ford loved Nazis, right? So, um, so this medal might have hurt him back home, but it did wonders for him in Germany. And um, yeah, he just like shot to the top of the charts, you know. And so. The next year, the Kubelwagen was already leading German soldiers into Czechoslovakia. And then as that's happening, he releases a new car in Ford called the Taunus, um, which just kills. And then he like, you know, then he starts making stuff that actually kills there. Uh, like he starts making vehicles with, sh- with tank treads and shit like that. Armored vehicles. So Ford vehicles from Cologne brought the Nazis like all over the place. There were. This is also, I should say, that GM and Opel were also both like heavily involved in this. Um, but uh, yeah, so from September of thirty nine to forty five, Ford Cologne makes uh, ninety thousand vehicles for Hitler um, in that time. And the yeah. other crazy thing about Ford Cologne is that uh, it also got into the armaments and, and munitions game. So what happens is, of course, Pearl Harbor in forty one, right? <clears throat> and um, the Americans enter the war. So according to like official Ford records, Ford gives up their factory uh, to the Germans who take it and they run it without anybody's understanding and in Dearborn. But this is like just evidently false. Like Ford, uh, from what I've read anyway, Ford does continue to make money uh, from the shares that they should have, but are now like technically taken over by this German uh, office, essentially, that now holds the American shares, but they still end up getting fucking paid for them. You know, and yeah. um, and on top of that, four Dearborn people ended up meeting with this fucking psycho named um, Robert Schmidt, who became like the the Nazi head of Ford Dearborn. Um, he of Ford, sorry, of Ford Cologne. Uh, he had already kind of worked there and stayed in charge. And like, uh, and um, all right, but he like meets with with Ford Dearborn in Portugal during the war. And even while the Americans had joined the war for about eight months. Ford Dearborn was still openly in control of the Ford Cologne factory where they were producing weapons, essentially. Hmm. So like Americans driving vehicles and by, at the same time, he was protesting that his factories in like Dearborn had to be used to produce military vehicles for the states. Right. So he's like right. gleefully making army vehicles for Nazi Germany and he's begrudgingly making them for the U.S. So U.S. soldiers, when they entered Germany, were driving on Ford like jeeps and meeting for jeeps you know uh yeah, yeah, yeah. and so uh so again again he he is the elder of zion you know like he's literally also, making I mean, money like, off he, both sides in an international war but um, also i mean the the ford motor company had an instrumental part in in founding gaz in the soviet union yes right? which was yes. one of the largest uh, auto manufacturers in the ussr Right. Even weirder than that, I th- well, I think is that uh, so yeah, so literally all sides of this war, right? Um, right. But uh, interestingly, we didn't talk about this, but Fordism was um, was very fascinating to the Soviets in the twenties and thirties, and they they openly adopted Fordist um, strategies for production in that time. Like Fordism was was well, almost accepted on the left for a huge well on the left time. Yeah, I the mean, left. <laughs> I mean, yeah. well, Lenin and yeah, the anarchists mean, did not care for it. They did not care for it. I mean, Lenin, I mean, to be honest, Lenin was fascinated by capitalism and its rationality. Yes. And he thought that Fordism and and also the German kind of Prussian state capitalist model is, you know, the the peak of capitalist rationality and therefore yes. basically of civilization and that it should be adopted and developed further into some kind of socialist direction. You're talking which, about Henry Ford, right? Uh, Lenin, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But I mean, gets hard me, to tell yeah, at a certain yeah. point, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, <clears throat> just to, to wrap up this now, um, this plant in Cologne, right? In in forty two, I think it is. It's forty two. America does this bombing campaign on Cologne, which which is quite famous. Um, like six hundred times is this city bombed, including like residential areas, etc. All flattened. Famously, the cathedral stays up. Right. This is a, right, a point right, of propaganda right. also for the Americans. The other thing that stays up is the fucking Ford factory that was churning <laughs> out weapons that were killing American soldiers. Un 
untouched, like minor, minor damage, but like generally speaking, untouched. Um, and it's, it's in such perfect operation, by the way, like people are still fucking working at it the whole time. In fact, it becomes one of the largest slave labor camps in Europe, much like IG Farben, where Russian and Ukrainian mm. prisoners are like literally swept up off the streets solely to be put into this factory and begin to work under slave labor uh, conditions while they still have like, um, you know, local workers there as well. Some of whom, a guy named Fritz in particular, uh, who I didn't want to leave him out of this episode, was an Edelweiss Piraten uh, while he was working here with a bunch of his friends. Like a lot of these dudes in the Ford factory fucking hated their jobs, hated the Nazis that were like in charge of their jobs and would do uh, a lot of little bits of sabotage. So Fritz in particular, one of his things that he liked to do was to like show up early in the day to like smoke on the docks with a few of his pirate buddies. And uh, as they smoked, they would like casually kick boxes of munitions and parts into the river, you know, just one after the other, taking it easy and then walk to work. And then apart from that, they would put like milk bottles under the um, tires. They would cut the tops off and the tires would like pop and uh there's all sorts of interesting fucking people that were there really it's really interesting these these mm. workers at this ford plant were not just taking it you know they were doing stuff but like that was the only real damage that happened to this ford plant like the allies fucking ignored it until they took it over for six weeks at which time hitler youth people started to like attack the plant and then it took real damage but um mm. nonetheless Ford managed to get a, a settlement with the U.S. government later for millions of dollars in reparations for the damage caused by the U.S. Uh, a bombing of Cologne, um, awesome. which which really probably was mostly due to the fucking Hitler youth. But um, so, yeah, it's, it's crazy. This so the, the and then finally, you know, the war is over and um and like people like Fritz get back to work only to discover that all of the Nazis that had been arrested when the war concluded were now back at work in management positions, including this guy, Robert Schneider, who was put back under like the, the supervision of Henry Ford II. So like this, this does cross generations. People often like to pre- present like uh, Edsel Ford, and, uh, which is Henry's son, and Henry the Second, which is Etzel's son, as like reformers of this, oh, they were Etzel like, is the know? son. Yes, yeah, he briefly okay. ran Ford, but mostly in name only. I was confused uh, by that name. Okay, yeah. So then uh, William Cameron didn't have uh, daily lunches with Henry and his wife, but with Henry and his son. Ah, okay, uh, that's yeah. Etzel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and I mean the, the yeah. workers in this colon plant after the war only managed to stop who was described as a notorious Nazi doctor, which is like the scariest thing you can be uh, from taking his job back at the plant by having a general, like a massive strike. And that was the only thing that actually stopped it. Uh, Like Ford, the Dearborn Ford, um, Look, they say they had no knowledge of any of this. Of course, they're going to say that shit. But like, we, it's Henry Ford, man. Henry Ford knows what's going on and loves Nazis. And uh, and when um, when like it was uh, in the air to take Dearborn out of the picture, like when when Germany entered war, when America entered war with Germany at the time, uh, the discussion was like, yeah, do we take these shares from the Americans and and nationalize them or whatever? And the answer in general was no. Like they said, like, we don't Hmm. fuck with Ford. Like Ford is on our side. Uh, He's like doing slowdowns of American production of vehicles. Like this is, we're not going to, we're going to like give this guy what he's due, you know? And so then, but Henry II gets, has a reputation for just broad neutrality that his reputation is that um, he just didn't really care. He's not a Nazi, but he's not political. And like, he'll just take the money and all this stuff. But like, they really did make a special effort to ensure that all the Nazis got their jobs back at this fucking place. So that's Henry Ford. Wonderful. That's the, the father of modern America and total fucking Nazi. Yeah. Hooray. Hooray. Yeah, I mean, we'll see throughout this arc. I think there is an argument. I mean, I'm like, as I'm, I'm reading this, I think there is like a specific kind of, you could say there is an American fascist tradition that I wasn't so much aware of. I wasn't either, Absolutely. actually. And I, yeah, I think yeah, it likes yeah. to be called Americanism. Uh, yeah. I, I see that word pop yeah. up all the time and I'm happy calling yeah. it that. 
Yes. So this is, I mean, this is it our is Americanist very, arc. Yeah, I mean, it it is very connected to the this kind of mainstream Americanism, as you say. I yeah. mean, definitely, is very connected to it. I we mean, didn't even talk so, about Henry Ford being like leading up the America First Party with like yeah. Charles Lindbergh and shit yeah. like that. Like, yeah, yeah. But That's these roots are even thing. deeper. One, like for, we mentioned, this idea of you know British Israelism. So one of the kind of uh, main characteristics of this ideology was that it was a kind of rationalization of British imperialism. So, you know, if Brits are the true God's people, you know, then this really explains the legitimacy of the global British Empire. And right. a ra- a later this kind of translated to America, you know. And, uh, and, and, this, and these tendencies that... Uh, like this, the the closest collaborator that Henry Ford had, who was the leader of the American British Israelis Israelite movement, uh, th- their point was exactly that. You know, the America is the new Britain, and yeah. um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, it's um, it's very. I mean, this kind of American fascism is very connected to Americanism and this idea of you know America being a special kind of place in world history. Okay. It's worth emphasizing too that point that uh, like a lot of what we associate with Nazism very mm. likely originated with Henry fucking Ford. You know? Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm glad to be back in America. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're going to continue this arc. Maybe we can mention we did our first interview. I mean, we were interviewed by someone. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh. Yeah, on a on a hilariously titled uh, radio show called Yana Pasaran, which I wish you know, Boris, maybe you can say it properly. No, I don't want to offend the Australians. Oh, you won't. They're nice. <laughs> yeah. So we were interviewed by a Australian anti-fascist um, radio show and a podcast called Yeah Na Pasaran, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, which you, yeah, that's the, <laughs> this was the first time we were interviewed. And you can find it every, anywhere, I think, where you can find podcasts. And yeah, so we were interviewed by our new Australian friends called Andy and Cam. And yeah, I'd I never been to was... Australia before. It was really nice of them to fly us yes, out there. Yes, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know. I think we did good for the, our first interview. It was nice to be... Yeah, and I got to ride around on the kangaroos. Pretty cool. Oh, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> hard getting you out. Hard getting you out. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I guess that's that. Or? Yeah, we'll be we'll be back at you and um, for uh, for the dedicated listeners, uh, for the patrons on uh, uh, Italian American fascism. <laughs> hey, uh, the, I'm fashion over here. <laughs> All right, yeah, look forward to that. patreoncom slash tenipod, twittercom slash tenipod. You're gonna hear my voice say that exact same thing again in like a minute. <laughs> so, see you then. Remember it. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Bye. Hey there. Fritz here from The Empire Never Ended. This has been one of our weekly free episodes for free people but for premium people we also have weekly premium episodes which you can get at patreon.com slash tenepod t-e-n-e-p-o-d and also follow our various social media things in the in the show description there like and subscribe them follow them like and follow and subscribe follow them do it